Hi there Fabric Jugglers, it's Babs here from My Fiery Phoenix and as you can tell I have been a little bit under the weather. I'm so sorry that I am late with this tutorial um, but I was I was struck with, um, it was a really nasty cold or flu or something. I was in bed for a couple of days, I completely lost my voice for three days um, and it's very difficult to record when you have no voice whatsoever. Um, I'm sure my throat is going to give out during this um, tutorial, so I apologise if I start coughing or sneezing or wheezing um, or indeed can no longer speak. So I apologise if any of that stuff is, is likely to happen. Um, and the tutorial today is um, a Valentine's collaboration with the uh, lovely Fabs Creates. I'll put a link somewhere on the screen and also in the description below. Um, so go check her channel out. She has a load of different DIY stuff. And I think she does things in Spanish as well, which is um, kind of funky, if that's what you're into. Um, now, the tutorial that I'm doing today is a um, folded fabric origami um, candle mat. Now, this one is flowers and, and reds and pinks, and it's all lovely for, for Valentine's. Um, this is a nice, simple version. You can gussy it up with... Um, with ribbons and bows and bobbins and all sorts of prettiness and sequins and all sorts of things. But I'm just taking you through a nice simple version to start you off and then hopefully your imagination can run what riot. Riot. I can't even talk. I warned you this might happen. Um, and then hopefully your imagination can run wild and you can create some stunningly beautiful items. Um, it can be used as just a table centre. You can use it so that it is uh, slightly more 3D and um, it looks good both ways up either as a sort of semi bowl or indeed as a sort of volcano effect. Um, I really like these with the, the stitching down the, uh, the spines of the petals um, and I just think that they are a very simple make. They're based off of um, a Dresden blade um, with extra bits so it's a square that has a Dresden blade slapped down in the middle of it um, and then the extra pieces are folded up and sewn together to give you the petal effect. Hopefully you're going to stick around and you're going to want to make one of these. There is a full written instructions and a download of the blade template if you don't have a Dresden blade of the correct size. Um, and if you think other people might be interested in this, please share it around. It's a free pattern, it's a free download. Um, there's full photographs and written instructions if my throat gives out and I just sound uh, 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 all the way through the video and you can't understand me. Um, so hopefully I've got all bases covered and um, it would be great if you would like, share and um, subscribe to the channel. So let's get sewing. So here we have the partially completed um, candle mat. As you can see, it's, uh, it's joining together, but we've, uh, we've got a couple of pieces missing. And we've got some, some texture added into the base with, uh, with top stitching. We'll use top stitching around the edges of each of the individual panels. And then once the panels are joined together, we then link the individual petals over to give us this lovely effect. So what I'm going to do is take you through um, each of the different stages and show you how you can... Um, create the final look. Now the first thing we need to do is find one or two um, coordinating fabrics um, and if you want to go into this extra layer of having the border on, go for a third coordinating fabric. Um, if you're just going for the two, you just need to cut out two the same size as I've used for my reverse, but I'm going to show you the slightly more complicated piecing of the the um, the alternate side with the border. So the first thing you need to do is find your fabrics. Now I've gone for three cottons which I think are quite lovely coordinating um, fabrics especially for Valentine's. So this was my back piece which is going to go in the centre which I know sounds counterintuitive but that actually ends up in the centre of the little petals and then I've got the centre piece which is my floral and then the edging, which is this satin effect um, print. Out of all of our fabric, what we need to create this particular um, petal piece or petal base is the six and a half inch square. So we'll need 12 of 
everything. So we'll need the six and a half inch square. You'll need a five and a half inch square of your iron-on interfacing. And you'll need a four and a half inch square of the floral centerpiece. You can fussy cut that if you prefer, or you can just um, slice off at the four and a half inch widths and then cut four and a half inch squares off of that strip. It's entirely up to you with the type of fabric that you get. And then you will need, I think, uh, six to seven full width strips at one and a half inches wide. So once you've got all of those pieces together, you can start assembling your, your squares, your base squares. Now the first thing I do is, is go through and press on all of my interfacing. I centre it up and just press it on. I like the fact that it's got at the edge piece. Um, some people I know feel a little bit uncomfortable with that, but this allows me to sew and turn and top stitch without generating any large, bulky, difficult to move fabric. So I just sew all the way on the edge with some movement to spare. <coughs> Excuse me, my throat is fighting back today. It really doesn't want to play ball. So I, I will press that first and then I'll move on to, uh, to sewing the edge pieces and you simply um, sew along the edge a quarter inch in so you'd have it right sides together, quarter inch, um, cut it down, right sides together, quarter inch, cut it down, right sides together, quarter inch. So I'll take you through that so that you can see me doing it and I'll also show you pressing the, um, the interfacing into place. Now I'm not sure whether you can see it um, on camera but what I'll do is I'll put a photograph up but there is usually a shiny side to the interfacing and that's the side that actually has the glue and that's the side that should go down onto your fabric. So I'll just pull over my pressing board and my iron. Now this is so much simpler than uh, than having an iron, ironing board that I have to set up and take down and move around. If you want to see how to make a, a pressing board for yourself, there is a tutorial and I'll, uh, I'll pop a link to that. So making sure that it is shiny side down, simply press into place. And you need to make sure that the temperature is warm enough. You don't want to boil anything away by having it on, on a linen setting, but um, a nice cotton setting should suffice and make sure that you press the weight evenly across so that you've got good contact between all of the surface and that is now done. You don't want it to be peeling off because when you turn the, uh, the squares right side out you really don't want this, this interfacing peeling away. So that's this sorted and I'll just set up the sewing machine and we'll move on with the next part. <laughs> now that we've got everything ready I'll be working with the one inch strips face up and the fabric squares face down and we'll be sewing with a quarter inch seam allowance throughout which for me means that I move my needle across to the right hand side and run it along the edge of my presser foot which makes life that little bit easier for me. I'm not going to bother with a back stitch or a back tack at the beginning or end of these because everything will be sewn over as it's um, pieced together and I'm using black um, cotton so that it's nice and easy for people to see in photographs and on video but hopefully um, it also won't detract too much from the final piece although if you wanted to you could use whatever colours you wanted um, to contrast or coordinate. Now, if I was working with more than one um, square of fabric I would be chain piecing these together. Um, if you're not sure what chain piecing is, it's where you have multiple squares or pieces that you are working down a single, a single base piece of fabric. So now that we have our first layer on, we need to press that open. So now that we have the first piece done, we will press it open as we would with any um, quilting piecing that we're working, which means that we press it toward the dark side. And then we can move on to the next layer, which will go along like this. So we pop 
the strip right side up. I always have the recently pressed item facing me and that way when I'm working with multiple patches um, or squares, rectangles, whatever, then the piecing will always go in the same direction. So I'll hold the, um, the thread down and stitch along the quarter of an inch in. And then we'll snip that away. So we set the seam and then we press it open and then hopefully you can see that this is now starting to shape shape. We'll go through that process once again. So the seam that I've just pressed open is closest to me. Set the seam and press it open to the dark side. And the reason we do it to the dark side is so that we don't see any of the um, darker colours through the lighter fabric in the centre. Now then one last time. Right side up for the strip. seam that I've just pressed open facing me. And then a quarter inch seam allowance all the way along. Time, and that is our completed square. Now we're ready to stitch the front to the back and the way we do that is by putting the two sides face to face and as you can see having this squared up it fits in very nicely indeed. So I'll just get the side back up and we'll sew that into place. Again we're going to be working with a quarter inch seam and what we will be doing is leaving a turning gap uh, so that we can turn everything right side out. So I'm going to be leaving a one to two inch turning gap. So I will start halfway, well, a third of the way up from one side. And I will be starting and ending with a back tack this time so that everything stays as strong as it can. and turn and so down straight down the edge make sure that you keep things straight as you go to lift the presser foot at any time, always make sure that the needle is inside, is down, in the down position. Always keep the needle down when you pivot. And again we're going to leave a nice gap for turning, so we'll stop around here. With a back tap. So that is now 
as it should be. And what we will do is trim away the excess threads. Clear those away. And clip the corners. And again, now maybe you can see what I was referring to earlier when I said that I, um, I prefer a smaller um, interfacing piece rather than one that goes all the way to the edge because this way it gives me room for the turning, it gives me room for the top stitching without any bulk of, um, of the actual interfacing itself. So we're now going to just trim the corners, being very careful not to cut through the corner stitches. and then we'll turn it. Now the way I turn it is to find the, the furthest away corners, hold and just push them through that gap. Then I go for one of the nearest corners and bring it through. This kind of reminds me of a, a wormhole turning inside out. Not that I've seen one but it's just the, um, the image that seems to come to mind from, uh, from various sci-fi movies and cartoons. And then we have the last corner and then just poke that through and it all seems very complicated until at the very last minute it isn't um, and, and then there it is we have a nice turned piece now we need to press out the corners I'm very lucky my nails are very long at the moment so I can simply use my nails to poke these out um, however if you don't have particularly long nails uh, don't use the tip of your scissors make sure that you use um, a, a wooden skewer a drumstick is actually very good, um, or a blunt pencil, but you want something that isn't actually going to poke holes in the corners or um, put ink in the corners if you're using a pen. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then we're going to press this open. So, and so I like to press from the back to begin with, just lightly around the edges, not the edge that has the turning gap. And then I come across to the top. Now what we want to do for the, the turning gap is make sure that the ends are tucked under so that when we top stitch, which we'll be doing as the next step, these will become sealed in place. So we just make sure they're rolled under and then press over that so everything is nice and even and neat. And the, uh, the top stitching will do two things. One, it will give it some extra strength and stability and it will secure the edge and two it will make it look slightly more professional um, the difference between this one and this one is simply the top stitching and it's not the best top stitching in the world but it looks more finished in this version so that's the last i need to use my iron and the pressing mat so i shall get those out of the way and then i'll show you how to finish off the top stitching and then attaching the pieces all together once you have all of your 12 panels sewn up and are ready to top stitch, before you do the top stitching, uh, there is one more thing that we need to take into account, and that is that you need to mark on the stitch lines. And so you'll need to print off the template, or if you already have a 30 degree um, Dresden blade, then you can use that blade. Make sure it's a 30 degree one and not which is 12 petals. Uh, rather than the, the smaller one, which then requires 20 petals, because if you try to do it with the wrong size blade, then you'll have all sorts of mess and you'll have to unpick a lot or start over from the beginning. So there is a downloadable as part of this pattern. Um, there'll be a link in the description below, uh, which will take you through to that pattern, and you can print off and cut out this template. And you simply pop it into the corners of your square, and mark on the sewing lines and then I'm using a tailor's chalk to do that so that's one line and then we pop the other one in excuse the planes going past overhead and then draw on the second line which is just there take the uh, pattern out of the way. So now we can top stitch around the edge and once we are ready we can start to assemble it. We're coming into the home straight now. 
after you've gone through and created the 12 panels, it does feel like it's taking a lifetime. However, I promise you that by the time you get to marking the panels and st stitching them together, it will all come together very quickly, like a dream. So I'm just going to do the final piece of top stitching. I prefer to do that from the red side. Um, it doesn't really make any difference, but I just prefer to do it that way. I also prefer to start near the top. Um, <coughs> and I have my needle in its far right position so that I can get a quarter inch or very close um, top stitch. And I always back tack this as well. Take it easy when you're coming to the corners. If you're not confident, then hand crank it as you come up to the corners. When you've pressed everything um, before we start this particular stage, you won't even need to think about where the um, openings are. Everything will just flow through smoothly. And don't try to rush it. Um, go faster if you feel confident, but don't try and rush. There's no real benefit to doing that. to where you started. If you end up with one of these little loops hanging around, just move the um, hand crank slightly forward and you'll be able to pull that through. It just means your stitch hasn't completed inside the bobbin area. Trim away the excess thread. Being careful not to actually cut through your, your fabric piece at this stage. So we've trimmed that away and now we can start to pair this up. And we need to be careful that we are going right side to right side. So we're, we're having the boarded side to a boarded side when we're doing this process. And then we simply stitch down the line that we have drawn. Get up the centre your needle if you're using the centre guide to work out where your stitches are going. Um, otherwise you'll find that you're out by a quarter of an inch, which will add up around the circumference of the entire item. Again, you can chain stitch these, or chain piece these, if you uh, are working all 12 in one sitting. <coughs> Obviously I've already completed a significant chunk of these. And so this is the reverse, this is the top side, and it will fold open. So what we're going to do is now add these final two into the ones that we've made. So what we need to do is find the edges, and we will put these. And please, please, please don't do what I was about to do, which is narrow end to wide end. Make sure that everything is turned so that you've got narrow to narrow. And if you don't have any markings of stitches, then you need to make sure that you draw those in. So I'm missing markings on this side, so I'll just draw that in before it all goes horribly wrong. And this is the narrow end. So we put the narrow end of the template down and then draw that in. Lovely. which means we can now start to attach these together. So as before, we'll put right sides together. <coughs> Excuse me. And then sew along that stitch line.
pushing away the excess. And we then have one final piece to join it all up into one circle. So we do need to just double check everything is as we're expecting it, narrow end to narrow end. is out of the way. See, we now have our full circle. However, we need to just complete these last few petals. And before we move on to these final petals, we need center, um, center lines in through here. And this gives it a little bit more structure and a bit of definition to the petals. If you look at these petals, they've got a nice um, elegant dive towards the center. There's a nice fold there. And if you look at these ones, if we're to, to pull them in, they just sort of lay there, saggy and baggy, um, and don't really do anything. Whereas this one has, has just that little bit more definition to it. So we'll put a couple of centre lines in here, and we'll just top stitch from inner centre to outer edge. Making sure everything else is kept out of the way. just that simple to um, to give it that, that spine effect. And then I'll do the last one from the centre out. Every single step that we're doing in this process is repeated exactly the same way for each of the 12 petals. So we have what looks a bit like a volcano to start off with, one way up, and if we flip that over, we can see that we've now got this nice boning effect all the way through. So we're just going to uh, attach these last four um, leaves. <coughs> and what we'll be using for that is the short stitch on a buttonhole with a length that is on the buttonhole length for our four step buttonholing. Now, once this particular step is completed, you could put butterflies or buttons or ribbons or bows or anything you want um, onto these edges just to pretty them up a bit. I'm going to leave it showing you the basics and then leave it up to your imagination to, to create something absolutely stunning. And we want to be matching the petals on the same square. So if we pick one of these squares, we want to take the two corners from that square to join them together. So we we'll fold that over and having set it to a stitch length of between 0 and 1 and we're on either step 2 or 4 which is the zigzag stitch of a buttonhole. We simply move it in and sew that on. And what I'll do is I'll move the camera around so you can see that in, um, in close up and it really is that simple. To, uh, to, to finish that off. Don't need to worry about hand stitching or hand sewing. And then we can just trim that up.
and that one's joined up nicely. So I'll just move the camera around so you can see the, um, the settings and the stitch I've used in more detail. So we, here we are with a stitch length in the um, buttonhole area. I'm on setting 4 and 2, which is the short edge of the buttonhole, not one of the long sides. And then if we come across, and I'll zoom in. You should be able to see the actual buttonhole stitch itself being formed. So we take two corners from the same piece, as I showed before, bring them together, place them underneath, and we want to be aiming to sew across the point of the top stitching. Drop that down, we should see the point in the middle of our presser foot gap, and then we simply sew. There we have. There we have our buttonhole effect closure. So I'll just continue on finishing those last few off. You have a completed table mat, which I think is actually ever so pretty. And you can fit your your um, candle in the centre of it. You can have it as a turret. You can turn it the other way up and have it as a mini bowl. You can use it as a sort of volcano-sided table decoration. Um, there are so many ways you can use it, but this is actually intended as a candle mat. But I think that's ever such a lovely effect for a very simple process. So hopefully this has been of use to you. Hopefully you're going to pop over and see my co-collaborator's um, video. I'll pop another link down to her Valentine make below. And um, please, if you've enjoyed this, stick around, subscribe and have a look at some of the other bits and bobs that I make. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it and you have forgiven me for my hideous throat. I'll speak to you again soon. Bye for now.